So let me just uh, remind where we left off last time. So we were considering symplectic dual pairs. So we had two symplectic resolutions. And we saw that symplectic duality was some list of relationships between these two pairs of symplectic resolutions. And the one that I sort of um, discussed the most was this relationship about the homology. So let me just remind you about that. So we had torus actions on these two symplectic resolutions. Then we considered the attracting sets for these torus actions. And um, then we said that the homology, and in fact, here, let me just uh, say that I said the right thing last time. So this, so re recall here that H of some variety of Z means the top Borel-Moore homology. And and the last last time I said, and it was correct, that the if we take the attracting set of in Y, then its top Borel homology actually coincides with the total Borel Moore homology. So just for this Y plus, we can either think top Borel Moore homology or, or, or total Borel Moore homology. And this top Borel Moore homology, um, this or total homology, <laughs> decomposes by the decomposition theorem. And uh, after using the decomposition theorem and this hyperbolic stock functor, we decompose it into the strata downstairs, the symplectic leaves downstairs. We see the um, the homology top homology of the attracting set in each strata, closure in each strata, tensor the top homology of the fiber over a point in the strata. So we we'll call here F alpha is pi inverse of some point little x alpha, little x alpha lies in some stratum capital X alpha. This map is called pi and under symplectic duality, we have a bijection between strata in the dual varieties, order reversing bijection. And also what's reversed is the roles of the fibers and the attracting sets. So we have a, some shrieks here. Shriek is just my notation for symplectic dual. And then we have equalities going like this. And these equalities are, are sort of not just equalities of vector spaces, but they're actually given by bijections between irreducible components of those two pairs of varieties. Right. Okay, I guess I can move this guy back up. Okay, so that's just a quick recollection on that. Um, but by the way, I just wanted to point out, so I listed a number of things that are structures common, or not common, but structures match on both sides of the symplectic duality. And I wanna um, point out that there's some more structures that I didn't talk about. Um, let me just point out two more structures. So I'll continue numbering. So this will be four. This four I may come to later if I have time. So at the end of the lectures, that's called something called the Hikita conjecture. So maybe if we have time, we'll come to that. And um, and number five, I'd like to point out, is a, a matching of stable envelopes, particular elliptic stable envelopes. And th this will actually be um, the topic of Richard Romani's lecture next week. So you should uh, tune in for that. Um, I think it's uh, toward the end of next week. And I should say that we have these different structures that match and you might ask, what's the relationship between the matching of structures as certain ones imply other ones. And um, usually you could say that there's, mo mostly I would say, no, we don't know that matching of certain structures implies other structures, but usually there's a kind of compatibilities between them, but not a perfect Im implication. I mean, I think the situation is very analogous, very similar to in the, usual mirror symmetry, 2D mirror symmetry, where, as you know, you have different structures like match, uh, matching of Hodge diamonds or whatever, mirrors of Hodge diamonds 
or homological mirror symmetry. Um, anyway, ma many other things that I'm not an expert on. And, and I, but I believe that, you know, it's not that one is like implies all the rest of them, but that there is interrelations between these different matchings. So it's a similar story here. And, and I would expect that there's probably more things that people just haven't thought about, or maybe they have thought about them and I just don't know about. Them. Okay. So today, what I'd like to do is talk about a particular example of symplectic duality, symplectic dual pairs, which turns out to in some sense be, um, I don't know, the main example, at least for me, it's the main example. And it, it concerns core varieties and affine Grassmannian slices. And after doing that, then if we have time today, if not tomorrow, we'll get into this Barman Finkelberg Nicodema construction. Okay, so to set the stage, I'm gonna start by reminding a little bit more about core varieties. So let me fix a Lie algebra. So G is semi-simple Lie algebra. And I'm gonna require it be simply laced. So in, a, in other words, an ADE type. And let me if, if associate some data to this semi-simple Lie algebra. We we'll take two <laughs> dominant weights. And we'll write, we'll, from these dominant weights, we'll extract two, two factors of numbers. So we write the first dominant weight as a linear combination of the fundamental weights. And we write the difference between these two dominant weights as a linear combination of the simple roots. And if it's, I would like to demand, like my lambda and mu are not just arbitrarily chosen, but they're chosen so that these VIs are, are integers. So WIs and VIs, not just integers, but not natural numbers. And sorry, here I, in both these sums, I ranges over capital I, which will be the vertices of the Dinkin diagram. The, the, the fact that VIs are uh, natural numbers, that's saying, I mean, that's equivalent to the fact that lambda is greater than or equal to mu in the usual partial order on the dominant weights. Then one more piece of data I'm gonna fix is I'm gonna write lambda as a sum of fundamental weights. So each of these are fundamental. So all, also those omegas that appear there are fundamental. So there's going to be w1 omega 1 w1 omega 1s among this list w2 omega 2s among this list but i'm fixing an ordering on them so there's a tiny bit more choice fixed here and the last thing i'm going to require is that all these um, lambdas actually are not just fundamental but um, so assume that they're actually minuscule so in, the, in type A, this is not a requirement at all, but in type D, there's only three, there's three minuscule fundamental weights. So it's a very strong requirement. And in, in type E8, there's no minuscule fundamental weight. So it means that you can't deal with E8. Now this assumption, well, there's a few, this assumption is not strictly necessary, but we'll see later why I did it on both, both on the curve variety side and on the other side. And, and, and if you're familiar with rise, you might ask, why did I bother saying that mu was dominant? Well, we'll, we'll also see the answer to that question. Um, so associated to this data, we're going to consider representations. So we have these fundamental representations, and then I'm going to tensor them together. So this tensor product of fundamental representations of our Lie algebra. And I'll write this as V lambda underline. So lambda underline denotes this list. V lambda underline denotes this tensor product. And then I'm really going to be interested in setting the weight space in this tensor product. Okay. What about this weight space? Well, we can take this tensor product and we can decompose it into irreps in the way we decompose any representation. So there are these multiplicity spaces, which give these homs and tensor. That you're over new dominant weights. And, and then in particular, we can look at the new weight space in there. So it's this um, 
this is the kind of decomposition of a weight space of a tensor product into multiplicity spaces, tensor weight spaces of Europe's. Okay, so let's go to quiver varieties. So what do we do? We choose an orientation, which won't really matter later in the day, but for now we'll choose an orientation of the Dinkin diagram. That oriented Dinkin diagram is gonna be called the quiver. So it's just a directed graph. And then we have dimension vectors coming from our Vs and Ws. Let's draw an example. So this is maybe for SL4. So the Dinkin diagram is of type A3. So I have three uh, vertices. My arrows go to the right. And then I have three framings. And last time somebody pointed out I wasn't very consistent which direction the arrows go to the framings. That um, anyway, I don't maybe, maybe this time I'll be more consistent. Send them to the framings. So W determine the framings. Vs determine the gauge vertices. So last time I explained that from this choice, we get a group G, which is the product of the GLVIs. And we get a representation of G, so which I'll call N, which is the direct sum of, um, so of CVI, CVJ, where I, J is a is an edge in the quiver and Hans of C V I C W. So then we form the Nakajima quiver variety, and I'll use this new notation. So I'll call it M lambda mu. So definition: We take the cotangent bundle of this vector space N and take the symplectic um, Hamiltonian reduction by the action of G. And then we take a projective GIT quotient. And then we put, like I did last time, two parameters. So the first parameter refers to the level of the MOM map we take. And the second parameter refers to the, the, the GIT parameter for our GIT quotient. And so chi here is a character of our group G. And we just take it to be the product of the determinants. So that's the definition of the Nakajima quiver variety. Well, that's the definition of the smooth one. And this is the definition of the affine one. So just the same thing, but at the zero level. And now we can uh, state theorems of Nakajima. So one is that M lambda mu is smooth um, and maybe I'll separate them out. Um, uh, M lambda mu is a resolution of M zero lambda mu and T max M lambda mu with finally many fixed points. Oops, I didn't describe T. Back up one second. So I have a torus acting on my curve variety. Where does it come from? Well, um, these I have these um, framing vertices and the squares. By the way, Alan Knudsen told me what, what, why they're called framing, because it looks like a frame, like a frame of a painting. Or maybe why they're called why they're drawn in squares, right? <laughs> so we have those those squares, those frames, and so the of course the general linear group of those vertices of the vector space of those vertices acts. In particular, we consider the T torus to be the product of the diagonals inside those vertices. So that torus. So that's our choice. And it acts with finally many fixed points. So by the way, right here, we use that mu is dominant. And right here, we use that lambda i are minuscule. So those assumptions are used in, 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 in this term. Okay. Two. Um, the symplectic leaves.
of this um, affine, affine core variety, the singular guy, are just given by um, regular loci in, in smaller such singular guys. Joel? Yeah? We have a question. Uh... Oh, great. Uh, is it possible to realize tensor products of Verma modules similarly? Um, um, yes, similarly, not exactly in the same way, but similarly. Um, it's sort of, in some sense, um, um, and this will actually come up. It's a good question because it, it sort of will come up a little later when we talk about this um, affine Grassmannian slices and, and coolant branches. Um, so there's kind of maybe two approaches you could use. One is you could take these framings to go to infinity. Of course, then the representation gets sort of bigger and bigger and it becomes more like a verma. Another approach is to get rid of the framings altogether, but then do a slightly different, um, realize the representation in a little bit different way. So, so if you get rid of the frames altogether um, and do something slightly different, then people sometimes call that the uh, Lustig nilpotent variety. And, and that can be sort of used to realize a Verma module. But it doesn't quite fit in the same framework that I'm talking about, so I won't talk about it. OK, the symplectic leaves of these singular guys are given by the uh, smooth loci or regular loci. I'm just following academic implementation um, in the um, in the uh, other such varieties. That's a new, by the way. And here are new ranges of over dominant weights that are trapped between lambda and mu. And um, part three. So. There's an action of our Lie algebra G on our friend from before. So the, we take this smooth square variety, take its attracting set, take its Brill Moore homology, there's an action of G on that thing um, such that. So here we have our fundamental decomposition that I talked about last today and at the beginning today. So we have the attracting sets of strata downstairs, tensor homology of fibers. So here F nu denotes the fiber over a point in this new strata inside the core variety M lambda nu. Okay, and this matches the tensor product. So the composition that I mentioned just a few minutes ago. So this is isomorphic. This homology of the attracting set in the total space is isomorphic to the mu weight space in the tensor product. And this matches this decomposition. Um, just have to be make sure you're careful about which way around it matches it. Yeah, this way around. So this attracting this homology of attracting sets becomes um, HOM spaces into tensor products, tensor product multiple same spaces. So we have quality here, quality here, quality here, so on. Okay. We have another question in the Q&A. Go ahead. Oh, sorry, I mean, uh, <laughs> I'm in the gallery. Oh, what, what's, what's the math? Well, the, the um, there's always a map from a projective GIT quotient to the corresponding affine GIT quotient. Um, this is proj of some ring, and this is spec of some ring. And uh, well, I'll have to think of for a second why 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 that gives a map. But but if you think of, I mean, it, it's uh, oh, oh, this is I think the degree zero part of the ring that this is proj of. So that's why there's a map. So this is like spec of some A0 and this is Proj graded ring. So there's always a map like this.
I didn't define the projective error in GIT quotient, but uh, I mean, I, I can if you like, but maybe it's too, it'll take, take us a little off time. Okay. Um, let's, let's look at an example. So this will be my running example in this section. It's a very simple example. G to the SL2 uh, lambda to be n copies of the first fundamental weight. I mean, there's only one fundamental weight in SL2. And mu to be uh, lambda minus alpha, the, the simple root. So the representation in question is, well, we have the fundamental representation is C2. So we're interested in C2 tensor n. And then looking at the n minus two weight space of C2 tensor n. C2 tensor n, well, decompose into many representations, but only, only two of those representations have an n minus two weight space. So this is, um, there's just two factors in this direct sum decomposition. We, can, we have the n-dimensional representation and it's n minus two weight space and it occurs once. Sorry, let, me, let me consider with my HOM notation. HOM Vn into C2 tensor n tensor the n minus two weight space of the n plus um, um, from the n minus two into C2 tensor n tensor its weight space tensor its weight space um, n minus two weight space and so everything in sight is one dimensional, except for this factor here, which is um, n minus one dimension. Okay. So what's our quiver in this example? Well, we just have a one here because one, the coefficient of alpha is one. So W is equal to N and V is equal to one. N, so we just have the uh, cotangent bundle of P1 as our quiver variety. Again, sorry, p n minus one is our variety. Again, resolving um, n by n matrices of rank uh, less than or equal to one and square zero. And we saw this before. There's two strata, and um, we saw before that over that this n minus one. So that the decomposition of the positive locus here um, looks like. Well, the only really interesting part is here where you have the, um, where you have this, all these orbital varieties. So you have this um, topomology of the space of uh, upper triangular matrices. We call this thing X, I suppose. So here X plus is gonna be those upper triangular square zero rank less than or equal to one matrices. And that's, that's responsible for this N minus one. Here we'd have fiber one, I guess I called it last time. And here I have x zero, which is plus, which is the point. And here I have uh, fiber zero, which is just the pn minus one. There's another point. And here I have n minus one components. So there we see the same decomposition. But by the way, um, I don't know if I really said this before, but any cotangent bundle of a partial flag variety in type A can be realized as an Nakajima quiver variety, um, as well as any resolution of a, of a solidity slice in type A, as well as any um, um, resolution of an intersection of a solidity slice with a nil point orbit closure. So in, in type A, lots of, I mean, any, in, like, anything you can think of can be realized as a Nakajima quiver variety. Well, not really anything you really can think of because in a few minutes we'll think of some other things which you can't. Okay, great. So that's the quiver varieties. Now I switch to this affine Grassmannian slices. So let's take uh, G to be the Langlands dual group to G, which looks a little weird, but it's not such a problem because actually the G is isomorphic to its Langlands dual Lie algebra. So <laughs> since it's an ADE type, the Langlands duality you don't really notice, we can kind of ignore it. But I mentioned this sort of for, uh, you, you, for in, in thinking about more general situations. And then we're gonna be interested in the affine Grassmannian of G. So, which means I take G over 
um, Laurent series, and I take the quotient over G over power series. Uh, at Frank Rice will play an essential role in the remaining talks in this series, actually in two different roles. So this is going to be the first way, and later we'll see a different appearance of the Frank Rice Minor. So because I took Langland's dual, the reason why I'm mentioning that is because this lambda I'm going to think of now as a co-weight of G, so a map from C star into my group, into the maximal torus of this group G. And therefore, we can define a point T lambda in the affine gross mining of G coming from this lambda. So for example, um, example would be in say the SLN, then this uh, lambda would be some integers adding up to zero. And T lambda would be the matrix T to lambda one up to T to lambda one. Thought of as a point in this affine gross mine. And we're going to be interested in, in orbits in this uh, in the affine gross mine. So two kinds of orbits. The first I call it gr lambda. So then I take the group I quotiented by this um, power series group, its orbit through T lambda. And this is um, something sometimes called spherical Schubert variety. It's an analog, or spherical Schubert cell, I should say. It's an analog of Schubert cells in a finite dimensional five variety. So it's affine Grassmannian. Um, one way to think about it is think of it as a kind of G mod P, and there's the orbits of P on G mod P. And, and these guys are finite, finite dimensional. The whole affine gross mining is infinite dimensional, but these orbits are finite dimensional. In fact, the dimension is given by the pairing of lambda with two rho, but it's not very important for our purposes. Oh, my, minor the important for our purposes, I suppose. And then a second thing I'm going to be interested in is called W mu, which are transverse to these first orbits. And so to, to find their orbit, I take a group transverse to my first group, which I denote like this, and take its orbit, and then we define this group. So I take G now of polynomials in T inverse. I have an evaluation map to G, sending T inverse to zero. And I take the kernel of that map, and that's G1 T inverse. So, so you can think of it as matrices, um, where the coefficients are polynomials in T inverse, and yeah, modulo T inverse, it's the identity matrix. So I take the orbit of that group through T mu and I got W mu. So these are transverse orbits. In particular, they're infinite dimension. So these are like some kind of Schubert cells and these are like the opposite Schubert cells. And then the main object of study will be called, denoted W lambda mu, which is the intersection of where lambda with W mu, and maybe even more importantly will be W bar lambda mu, which is the intersection of where lambda bar with W mu. So this guy, this guy here is an affine variety. Finite dimensional, in fact, the dimension of this W lambda mu bar is, is um, two rho paired with lambda minus one. Rho is a half the sum of the uh, positive roots or maybe positive covariance. Uh, oh, positive roots. Okay. So um, one more construction. So this is gonna be this W lambda mu bar, this is going to be our affine Poisson variety. It's also Poisson. And now we're going to construct its symplectic resolution. So to do that, we need one more sort of construction. We form um, GUR lambda underline. So I'm using this list now. Another, this is just notation. So it's, it's a notation is suggesting that it's a kind of product of these GUR lambda eyes, but not exactly a sort of Tw twisted product. Okay, so that's just notation. Here's the definition. So it's a sequence of points in the affine Grassmannian. 
with the condition. So these bracket, these G's denote elements of of, uh, of G of Laurent series, and brackets G denotes the corresponding point in that fingers money. And the condition is that G I minus one inverse G I brackets is in Ger lambda I. Okay, so I, I, I admit this is probably like a little confusing if you haven't seen this before. Um, the way that uh, I like to think about this, one way I like to at least like to explain it, is that um, these, um, we're, we're studying points in the Affangersmanian, like this. So these are my um, G1, G2, G3 and so on. And um, they, are, they have distances between them described by these lambdas. So this is distance lambda one, this is distance lambda two. So it's a variety of, of polylines in the Affangers Manian. So sequence of points with prescribed distances between them. So th this condition can be thought of as distance between gi minus one and gi. And this distance, I mean, just some formal notion, but it actually has some kind of metric implications. For example, if we take G to be equal to um, PGL2, then the Affangers minus of G is an infinite tree, or more precisely, the vertices of an infinite tree with P1 branching. So that means it looks something like this. So we have a tree, but an infinite tree. And at every, at every vertex, there's many, many edges. In fact, a whole P1 of them coming out. So that's, and then it continues. And that Frank mining is just the points in this tree. And this distance is just the distance in the tree measured as like along the edges. Okay. So that's the definition of this GER um, lambda underline. And then finally, we define W tilde lambda underline mu by definition. Oh, wait, one piece of notation, more piece of notation. This space, GER lambda underline, comes with a map, which I'll call M lambda underline to the affine Grassmannian, it, and it takes this, this sequence to the last point in the sequence. So just remembering the last point of this line. And then I define um, W tilde lambda underline mu to the M lambda underline inverse of uh, W. So I just want that last point to lie in this sort of slice W mu. Okay, so here's a theorem about these spaces. Um, I guess this theorem basically due to myself with um, Ben Webster, Alex Weeks, and Oded. So the first point is that W tilde lambda mu is a uh, symplectic resolution of W lambda mu. So in particular, it is a resolution and it has a symplectic structure and, um, and the, the W lambda mu has, is, is a, is, has a plus one structure. And then, uh, uh, this torus, oops, okay. So torus here will just be the torus of the group, which is acting um, just by left multiplication. So T acts on this W tilde lambda mu with finally many fixed points. Oh, and I promise this to tell you, this guy, this first fact, this uses that lambda i are minuscule. 
And here we see a manifestation of something I mentioned last time, which is that when this lambda I minuscule on the quiver variety side meant that was needed to ensure finally many fixed points. And on the dual side, it's needed to ensure the, that we have a resolution. So um, that's interplay on both sides. And one structure, existence of resolution matches the other structure, finding many fixed points for the total section. Um, OK, continuing this vein. So another result is that the, the symplectic leaves of this W lambda mu bar R W uh, nu mu bar, or maybe nu mu delta bar, I suppose. And that's for nu's dominant weights trapped between lambda and mu. And here we see um, a promised feature of some like the duality bijection between the leaves. So in both cases, the leaves are indexed by those dominant weights trapped between lambda and mu. And so part four, and this part four basically just uses the, it's not really our theorem, this is just part of the geometric Satake correspondence of Mirkovich and Bologna. And um, says there's an isomorphism. Between, well, that's more as follows. So between the top homology, also full homology of this W tilde lambda mu bar attracting set, and this weight space in the tensor product, compatible. So just a nice of vector spaces, but compatible with these decompositions. So recall. Um, from the representation theory, we have this de decomposition by the isotopic components. Sorry, no, no, no subject there. Uh, tensor, the weight space of the group. And geometrically, we're gonna have here sitting the homology of the fiber, which will be all right, M lambda mu inverse of this point T mu. Tensor, the homology of the attracting set in the leaf. And then we have qualities. And this guy, I mean, is sort of a famous guy. This guy is called the, the or the early disciple components of this guy are called the American Rich Bologna cycles. Joella? Yeah. A question? Yeah, um, yes. Uh, is this situation the symplectic dual of the quiver variety picture you presented the first? Yeah, yeah, that's the whole point. <laughs> okay. Yeah, that's exactly what I'm about to say. But before I say that, I'll just do a quick, quick, quick example. <laughs> if we take lambda and mu as above, so lambda is n times the first fundamental weight and u is n times that fundamental weight minus alpha. Um, then uh, this w lambda mu bar is just this c2 mod c mod n and it's then we in disguise its resolution. And okay, I already discussed um, previously how this decomposition of homologies works in this case. I won't, I won't bother saying it again, but in fact, um, well, you might be, you know, you might, you might say, how do you see this so easily? Well, you, you can actually write down explicitly in matrices, this, this, this isomorphism. Um, another fact that's true in general fact is that, well, the dimension formula I gave predicts, well, we have lambda minus rho, rho, mu, which is rho. So we just get two, the dimension of this quiver variety will just be given like this, which is just equal to two. So we definitely get something, um, uh, not quiver variety, avant gros minus slice. We definitely get something um, two, two dimensional here. And in fact, you always get sort of C2 mod C mod n. As is, for all, all two dimensional avant gros minus slices are of the form C2 mod C mod n. Okay, so now I come to what uh, Francesco said. So this, claim 
is that these guys are symplectic dual. And well, um, what does it mean to say this in fact? Well, I'm just saying I had some list of things which are generally supposed to match, and uh, I should ch check them off one at a time. Well, I, I did explain quite a few of them, but let me explain actually go back to almost the, the first one I said, which was a matching of the, the algebra of the torus with the um, H2. So what torus do we have? So recall that I have this C star to the sum of the Wi's acting on the variety. Try to make Nakajima's variety. There we go. Acting on the variety. Um, if you're careful, you'll notice that this action maybe is not um, is not effective. Like some portion of this C star to the sum of Ws actually acts trivially, but ignore that for a second, because actually it will match on the other side. And um, so the Lie algebra, so that was our, our torus here. So it's Lie algebra, well, we can try to see to the sum of the Ws. Now, what that's supposed to match H2 on the other side. Well, this guy, this W lambda tilde mu, is by definition a subvariety of the affine Grassmannian to the n, just because it's by definition n points in the affine Grassmannian. So I end up with a map backwards from H2 of the affine Grassmannian to the n, which of course just H2 of the affine Grassmannian um, directs on itself n times. I mean, the, if I took the cohomology, I would get the cohomology, full cohomology, but so I get uh, H2 directs on itself n times because I have the H0s tensor many, many H0s and then one H2. So you get this H2 directs on itself n times. So I'll map backwards like this. And, and this um, um, sum of the sum of the w is actually equal to n almost by definition. This n is the same as the sum of the w's because um, remember what was n? It was used to make this list. Well, first of all, this. Let me just write this down, and you'll see it's obvious. Okay, so the, the n here appears because it's the the list of these fundamental weights adding to lambda. And the Ws is how much of each fundamental weight occurs. So of course, N is the sum of the Ws. So in this way, we see that um, this torus, its Lie algebra is C to the N, and also this um, uh, H2 here is also C to the N. So we get. I, I hesitate to write their isomorphic because they're not isomorphic, but somehow they actually have exactly the same sort of kernel. So it, they match. So, oh, I didn't really say this, but the, the H2 of the affine gross minus one dimension. And its Picard group is, is, is just Z. It has a canonical line bump. OK, so that's, that's the matching of the member just right as an equation. So we get this matching like this. Matching of this Lie algebra of the torus with this H2. And let's look in the opposite direction, because it's also quite instructive. So in the opposite direction, um, Let's start, I guess, with the affine Let's start with the quiver variety again. So how do we get line bundles on the quiver variety, or how do we get cohomology of the quiver variety? There's this um, Kirwan map. So because it's a quotient, we get the, these tautological line bundles coming along. So we end up seeing that H2 is just um, C to the I. So I here is the vertices in the Dinkin diagram. So these, this, this, the line bundles correspond to determinants of tautological vector bundles. So anybody who's worked with curve varieties, um, this will be familiar. And if you haven't, um, this anyway, part of the more general phenomenon called this. Kerwan map. So that's the H2 of the quiver variety. And on the other hand, if we take our affine Grassmannian slice, I have um, this is a this is living in the affine Grassmannian of this group G. And 
so the torus of the group G, as I mentioned before, will act here in the resolution. And, and this torus, this group G has Dickin diagram with vertices I, so this torus is just C star to the I. So we get um, H2 of this variety isomorphic to the C to the I, which is the, the algebra of this C star. And, that, and so that's the matching there. And what's, what's you know, beautiful about this is if you could look at some examples, you might say, okay, well, sometimes maybe this tautological line bundle is trivial because, um, because of, you know, the nature of the queer variety, maybe it's not really, doesn't use that vertex. And so the tautological line bundle is trivial. And then if you go look on the dual side, you'll see, oh, that, that like component of the C star, that C star there will also act trivially. So everything always matches. Okay, so that's the matching of the tori. And then, of course, the cohomological matching is what I mentioned. Um, so we saw, sorry to scroll a lot, but we saw these two isomorphisms. So this Mirkovich Belonian isomorphism here, we're seeing this representation theoretic decomposition shown um, geometrically here in, in using the, this Mirkovich Belonian result, and then going further back up, the same thing, but now with flipped flipped roles. So I, 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 here I have tracking set fiber and down below I had fiber a tracking set. So I flipped the roles and that's exactly what we expect with some like duality. And I already mentioned that we have this bijection with leaves order reversing bijection with leaves. In fact, you can even go a, a step slightly further and you can produce a bijection. You can produce a bijection between the irreducible components of, say, one of these fibers. This is in the curve variety. That's the side of the curve variety with the irreducible components of this attracting set in the Affan Grossmannian slice. I mentioned before that these guys are called Mirkovich Lonin cycles. And, and what, one way I know to produce such bijection is using. <laughs> Theory of Mirkovich alone in polytopes. So I wrote some many papers about this this topic. But anyway, I'm not going to bother explaining that. But there is exact bijections. I see a question: Where do the Poisson structures and symplectic structures on affine gross mining come from? Thanks. That's a great question. Um, of course, I've been like not really discussing these affine these symplectic structures too much in general in this talk. But I apologize. Um, so the answer to the question is: We have a Manin triple. I'll just write down this. Half and Grossmanian slices come from the Manon triple. Like so. Okay. So there's just a an aside, and this is this is explained in our in our paper first KWWY paper. Okay, great. So um, okay, so now I have uh, a few minutes, so I'll, I'll maybe give a little preview of this Robin Finkelberg and Kojima construction, and then we'll really get into it next time. So, so what's the idea? Well, we have this notion of symplectic dual pairs. We've seen that um, many examples now, but now you might ask how, is there some systematic way of constructing the dual of, if you have one uh, symplectic resolution, is there some systematic way of producing the, the dual symplectic resolution? And well, in general, still, but there's no really good answer for that. But here's a sort of par partial answer for that. So the answer, let's look at our list of some of these symplectic resolutions. We saw we had hypertoric varieties. 
we had river varieties. We had something like T star GMOT peas, and we had these affine grass mining slices. So for these classes of examples, they're of the following form. You take the um, cotangent bundle of some representation of G and then take a Hamiltonian reduction by G for some group G, right? They were always of this form. And whenever our um, symplectic resolution is of this form, that's when we can use the BFN construction. So it's this class of examples. So to use a slightly physics-y language, or well, not yet, but it, so let's start with the following data. G, a reductive group. So usually this group G will be product of some GLNs or a torus, which is just a product of C stars, GL1s. So G will be a reductive group and N will be a representation. And um, for the physicists, they would say that this G and N define well, one of these theories, uh, a 3D gauge theory, which is one of these uh, N equals four supersymmetric theories. So they define a 3D gauge theory. And I mentioned before that from any uh, these N equals four supersymmetric field theories, the physicists associate two spaces, one called Higgs branch and one called a Coulomb branch. And this Higgs branch is just, for mathematicians, is just this Hamiltonian reduction. So just take the cotangent bundle of N and take the Hamiltonian reduction by G. So that's the Higgs branch. And the Coulomb branch, um, I guess, was uh, more mysterious, both, both to the physicists and the mathematicians until, well, work of some physicists, and I don't, I don't know the physics literature very well, and then the work of, of, uh, um, of Barbara and Finkelberg Nakajima. So let me just give a like a sort of rough description, and then we'll give a more precise description next time in the remaining five minutes. Okay. So for this rough description, um, let's introduce the following weird um, scheme. So sometimes called a ravioli curve, sometimes called a bubble, I'll call it B, raviolo curve, maybe more precisely. So you take two copies of the punctured disc and glue them, sorry, two copies of the formal disc and glue them together along the punctured disc. So it's, it's a non-reduced, it's a non-separated curve. Um, the usual way I like to think about this thing is, um, you probably know that if you want to construct P1, you should take two copies of A1 and glue them along C star. It's a usual description of how you build P1. And usually when you do that, you, you, um, you don't glue them like directly, but you glue them using the inverse map. So somewhere in, the, in this gluing thing, there's a T goes to T inverse. If you forget to do T goes to T inverse, well, you, you can still glue them, but then you get a non-reduced, a non-separated curve, so something like this, right? You end up with A1 with double origin. So it's a kind of bad version of P1. So this bubble curve is like the bad version of P1, and then you just look uh, in a formal neighborhood of this doubled origin. So that's the bubble curve. So it's pretty close to P1. <laughs> if you don't like it too much, you can just think about P1. In fact, um, um, in Nakajima's first paper about the Coulomb branches, um, he explained basically that the natural like thing to use would be P1, but uh, for the purpose of, well, for some purpose we'll see soon, it actually only works if you use this bubble curve, but you can think of it as just P1. Okay, so what are we gonna do with this funny bubble curve? We're gonna consider the following moduli stack of maps from this non-separated curve uh, into the stack 
of n mod g. So n here is a representation of g, reductive group g, and we consider the stack quotient n by g and consider maps. So I, I emphasize that you have to use the stack, stack quotient here, whereas in constructing the Higgs branch, we've always used the um, GIT quotient. And when we, in, in doing so, we've like thrown away the, the unstable locus. But here we need to use the full locus, full everything. So we take this full stack quotient here. We take such space of maps. Then we take the homology of this mapping space. And this homology carries an algebra structure. The convolution algebra structure. Um, so where does this algebra structure come from? We'll see, um, like, I I'm gonna redefine this thing in a slightly different language next time. So, uh, and, then, and then I'll explain the algebra structure in a different way, but um, intuitively it comes from some kind of gluing of these bubble things. So it comes from considering uh, like a disc with tripled origin. And, and this, so considering such a modulus maps from such a moduli space into the, to, sorry, the moduli space of maps from such a tripled disk, or disk with tripled origin into the stack. So that's used to define this convolution algebra structure. And that, that somehow is like related to why we don't use P1 because here we have this possibility of this tripled origin. And this algebra structure, so it's, it's similar to the, um, if you've studied the Steinberg variety inside of the product of the cotangent, the square of the cotangent bundle of the five variety, you know that this Steinberg variety, its homology has a convolution algebra structure, like in the book of Chris Ginsburg. Um, what's a little different is that in this case example, the convolution algebra structure is commutative. So this is a commutative algebra. And since it's commutative, we can then take spec of it and we can get a scheme. And that's what we'll do. So that's the definition of the Coulomb branch, at least the, the, the singular. So this is going to be the dual of this Hamiltonian reduction. It's going to so these guys are going to be some like dual. And this guy is going to be the Coulomb branch. So, um, don't have too much space. M C G. Okay, um, at least, so at least this is how to produce the singular guy and then you can produce the smooth guy as well. Okay, so next time we'll um, I'll define all this stuff in here a bit more precisely, or this is pretty precise, but I'll define it more in a way that makes it easier to work with. So, we'll, we'll, and we'll see some examples and uh, go from there. Okay, I'll we'll stop there, any questions? You have a question in the, you have two questions now in the Q&A. Okay. Um, mentioned that stable envelopes play a role in symplectic duality. What is known about stable envelopes for slices in the affine gross minion? Um, um, so this is subject, I guess, of Ivan uh, Danilenko's thesis which hasn't yet been published. <laughs> so it has been studied by Ivan Danilenko, but it, I mean, sorry, not been published. I mean, not even appeared on the archive. So, so it, it does sort of uh, exist the study, but not, uh, not in public yet. And another question from anonymous person. Um, can we define W lambda mu for a non-integral lambda mu? Um, No, no, I don't know how to define it if they're not integral. Um, 
One thing we'll see soon though, is um, how to define it when mu is not dominant. So in the definition, at some point, the beginning today, I said, we assume mu is dominant. And um, if you're paying close attention, you would see that actually on the queer variety side, much of what I said goes through, even if mu is not dominant. Um, it's still a smooth, it's still, it's a resolution, but not exactly of this singular guy, not, not of M0 lambda mu, but it's a resolution of something. So there's still a smooth quiver variety, even if mu is not dominant. And, um, and going on the African Gosmanian side, well, actually, it looks like much of what I said also goes through <laughs> if mu is not dominant, but we'll see soon a, how to really good definition of W lambda mu when mu is not dominant. But for non-integral mu, I don't know. What is G of, of the Laurent polynomials of, of, okay. Let's back up then. Andrea, Andre answered that question. So on your behalf, I guess. Right, Andre? Yes. So don't worry. He answered it? Yeah, oh, Andre. Yeah, question yeah. about quotation. Ah, <laughs> uh, great, great, great. I took the liberty. Any other question? <laughs> Thank you. So I, I have a question, maybe. So before you said that uh, quiver I just said for uh, Finite uh, Dinkin diagrams, as I understand well, where uh, correspond simply dual to slices. So if I have uh, any Nakajima variety, this corresponds to some uh, slice. And uh, I mean, what it would be the simply dual? Uh, if you have a curve variety if, uh, outside a finite type, is that the question? Yeah. Uh, yes. Yeah. So um, well, we'll get to that later. Yes. <laughs> I know. Uh, yeah. That's that. That then we are, then we're in the realm of generalized affine Grassmannian slices, and and those are defined in this Coulomb branch way. So we'll okay. We'll, we'll get we'll get to that later in the talk. But in in um, maybe I should say though in affine type A, which might be the case that you're most interested in. Um, in affine type A, then the symplectic dual of Nakajima core variety is again a Nakajima core variety. Well, sorry, when at least when mu is dominant. Mm -hmm. um, the reason, the reason for that is is, and it also happens in finite type A. And and the reason for that is there's this funny um, rank level duality, which happens in finite and affine type A, which 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 ends up manifesting itself as an isomorphism between affine Grassmannian slices and core varieties. So something's called Mirkovich v Warnov isomorphism. Um, okay, but I'll maybe I'll make sure to address that question a little more precisely a little later. Any other question, remark? Let's see. No. So I guess we can thank Joel again. <laughs>